Um, thanks very much for joining us, Marcus. I haven't seen him for 25 years or something like that. He's in Australia, 5 a.m. Thank you very much for getting up quite quite so early to be with us for, for, for an hour. We want to look at the, the Julian Assange case, chiefly the implications of what it means for information and the media, journalism, free speech in particular, under late stage capitalism, imperialism. Um, Marcus is, is a journalist in Australia. He's a member of the Australian Labour Party, was a former Labour Party secretary, press secretary, sorry, and was the a former president of the Journalists' Union in Australia. So I'm sure you have uh, lots of insights. Thanks for joining us. About 20, 25 minutes, and then we can have questions and contributions from the floor, I'd say. Thank you. Thank you, comrades. It's great to be joining you from uh chilly rainy Sydney at five o'clock in the morning reminds me of London summers um I think it was interesting a, a comrade there just said that they thought that the Labour Party in Britain was a unique uh, uh development uh, of course the Australian Labour Party is also a very similar type of organization built on the trade unions here so I really want to present this short talk in two parts um first I'll just look at the founding and politics of WikiLeaks and around Julian Assange, uh, WikiLeaks aims and some thoughts about the nature of information under capitalism. Uh, and then I'll take a bit of a broader look at who controls information, uh, who owns it, and raise some questions about program privacy and, and social media. Um, as president of uh, MIA, M -E -A, -A, stands for the Media Entertainment Arts Alliance, which is a union that covers journalists, actors, crew, and uh, musicians. Um, there was a period of forced amalgamations of unions under a previous Labor government, and we were jokingly referred to as the Clowns and Jugglers Union when we were all for forced together. But anyway, we look after the arts. I'm no longer president. I'm just a rank and file member there. Um, so... Julian Assange has been a member of uh, my union since 2007, uh, when really WikiLeaks kicked off. WikiLeaks as a project, though, was many years in gestation. Uh, Julian Assange registered the domain WikiLeaks.org in 1999, but it wasn't first really used until 2006. Uh, WikiLeaks was formally launched in 2007, the year he joined my union. Um, the inspiration for WikiLeaks reportedly, and a lot of this is secondhand stuff, um, I, I don't know um, Julian Assange, but I do know some of the, um, I, I know the editor-in-chief, uh, Kristen Trufson, and a few other people are involved. Um, so the inspiration was reportedly the publication of the Pentagon Papers by Daniel Ellsberg in 1971, which of course revealed the secret history of US involvement in the Vietnam War from 45 to 68. Those papers revealed the US knew it could not win the Vietnam War. Uh, the US government had been systematically lying to the population. And in that, it was revealed that the actual war aim of the Vietnam War was to contain China, which sounds rather familiar at the moment, doesn't it? At the launch, WikiLeaks proclaimed, quote, the method is transparency, the goal is justice. And Assange said it was important not to confuse the goal and the method. In, the, in, the, in my article in Weekly Worker uh, recently, um, I said that WikiLeaks' general approach could be described as techno-anarchism. I think uh, that's a pretty straightforward. Uh, what I mean by that is using technology, uh, WikiLeaks aims to disrupt power structures of the establishment to give ordinary people access to the hidden information of the state. And this will spontaneously, I suppose, uh, empower people to make radical change once um, the scales fall from their eyes. Or the um, 2011, at a speech in London uh, to a demonstration, Assange had said, if wars can be started by lies, peace can be started by truth. I rewatched that speech last night, my time. Um, it's, it's quite interesting in the context of him being released. He, he said he did want to see radical change. He also said Thatcher was right. There is no longer any society. There are just, uh, there's just a transnational security elite carving up the world using your tax money. 
And to change that, we must not just petition governments, we must take it, them over by forming our own networks of strength and mutual value. Sounds very anarchistic to me. And I don't mean that as an insult, of course, I just mean that as a, as a political program. Um, he said, quote, wars are a result of lies. The Vietnam War was a result of the Gulf of Tonkin incident, a, a lie. Iraq War, a result of lies. Wars in Somalia, results of lies. Interestingly, he said the Second World War and the German invasion of Poland as a result of carefully constructed lies. So, I mean, I'm sure that was hyperbole for the um, hyperbole for the um, or the speech, but it does sort of reveal a lack of understanding of historical and class forces that lead to such conflict. Uh, he seems to say that wars come as a result of lies peddled by the media and that reality is constructed around by liars. Uh, for him, this make, should make us optimistic because he said if wars can be started by lies, peace can be started by truth. So our, that is our task, to reveal the truth. Um, it's worth going back further to remember Assange came from the hacker community. Um, he actually knew people who knew him uh, when he was at university. Uh, he didn't finish university in Melbourne. As a teenager, he was a hacker using the, the, the handle Mendax. Um, he broke into the Pentagon as a teenager and possibly NASA, although that's never been proven or admitted. Um, he was uh, caught and charged and let off pretty lightly, given his age. Uh, and I don't think there was anything particularly men mendacious, despite being Mendax. Um, in the early 90s, he actually cooperated with police to assist their child um, exploitation unit to uncover uh, serious uh, sex crimes and child exploitation online in the 1990s. But of course, WikiLeaks, after it launched, is best known for its release on the 5th of April for collateral murder. Um, this was followed in October that year of Cablegate that showed the extensive war crimes by the US and its allies um, in Iraq, and later revealed crimes in Afghanistan as well. 14 years, I won't go into all the legal ups and downs of his case, that's well documented, although uh, still uh, a lot of lies uh, and misinformation push like that uh, around that. Um, so Assange really is a modern day man in the iron mask. Uh, hidden by the, uh, the regimes for 14 years uh, as an example for us all not to uh, overly embarrass the empire. And But as a result of his extensive detailing of war crimes, of uh, a secret state, you could almost say, um, uh, at which the, you know, the masses are well aware of, this is now common information, has empire crumbled? No, it certainly hasn't. I would say power structures of imperialism have not shifted at all, really, because of these revelations by WikiLeaks. Um, I think they have given us some campaigning. I think in Australia, and I think can't remember the election, there was briefly a WikiLeaks party that actually unsuccessfully stood in the Senate here. Um, so I'd say that while those at the centre of the WikiLeaks campaign uh, extremely intelligent, dynamic, interesting people. Um, they were very dogged and courageous in the long-term campaign to have Julian released. Uh, I'd say there's sort of an outer layer of perma campaigners for Julian Assange who were actually pretty nutty conspiracy theorists, a lot of them. I was regularly attacked as president of the union for not doing enough. Um, uh, by a lot of these people. I, was, I got a lot of um, online harassment because of this. Um, there was an overlap with anti-vaxxers. You see some of the far right in the US who actually think that Julian Assange was motivated um, to support Trump over Clinton. I, I don't uh, think that's the case. I think like any journalist endeavor, they released information that they had which may or may not have come from Russian intelligence sources, but they released information they, they had to get maximum coverage, and that, that was around Clinton and her emails. Um, but I don't think there was an active um, uh, support for Trump in that. 
But I think within those layers, if not in the centre of the Assange um, crew itself, uh, their opposition to US power and their identification of US power as the major uh, force for evil, I suppose, the major force for no goodniks, um, lands for many of them, though not all of them, it lands them in the camp of the idea that any of the US strategic enemies uh, are our friends. Uh, so some of them are implicit, some of them explicit supporters of regimes in Damascus, in Moscow, in Tehran, in Beijing. Um, but for most of them, it's more of a, a, a pursuit of what they can, they call a multipolar world. This means they support the BRICS, they support um, the shift away from the US dollar as the major uh, currency in the world. And they seem to think that having, uh, the major problem is that we have a unipolar world around US imperialism and their political pr program is to push for a multipolar world that counters US imperialism. So their allies are uh, uh, not to be found in the world's working classes, uh, but to be found in um, klepto and murderous regimes around the world from Beijing to Tehran and Moscow. Uh, and I, I think this is obviously a false and dead end program, um, but it is one that bubbles through a lot of this, um, ca these campaigns. Um, we see that in, in some, uh, yeah, it, it, I think the audience here today knows that that is just a dead end uh, campaign and program. I mean, this week we've had the Shanghai Cooperation Organization meeting in Kazakhstan um, with Putin was there, um, Xi Jinping was there. Interestingly, Modi did not attend but sent a senior spokesperson. I think that shows Modi um, is trying to keep a foot in both camps, um, both the through his involvement in what's called the Quad with the US, Australia and Japan against China, but he's also got a foot in, the, the, in that camp. But the, one of the main themes of that meeting that's just finalised yesterday was for a, a multipolar world, which is exactly what these, um, uh, I call it the anti-imperialism of fools. Um, they believe that they're campaigning against US imperialism, but they're just creating uh, a world that is drifting towards war. So, of course, for Marxists and consistent Democrats, uh, Beijing, Tehran, Moscow and Damascus offer no path for peace, for justice, for a world without war. Um, we need to favour our own camp. The world's working classes are the only, um, is the only agent globally that can lead us to a, a beyond a world driven by corruption and war. So the campaign to free Julian um, has been long and slow. Um, from tiny numbers of isolated activists. I think there was a very successful smear campaign about a decade ago against Assange. Uh, uh, I, th I mean, I think as a personality, he's obviously a complicated person just from looking from the outside, uh, accused of having a messiah complex. Uh, I don't know enough about the guy. I've never met the guy to know, to be able to pass judgment on that. But uh, obviously very driven and one-eyed in terms of his his project to to reveal information about and um, probably didn't um, uh, build a lot of friendships along the way to do that. Um, but the the campaign to smear him and uh, and I think there's a lot still a lot of conspiracy theories around that. Um, the fact that the U.S. Um, when Pompeo was uh, head of the CIA and then later Secretary of State, literally did hatch a conspiracy to either abduct or murder him, uh, sort of does show that being a conspiracist in this area is not completely crazy. Uh, but there, there, I think there have been a lot of conspiracy theories around this, which um, makes it a, a mucky area to pass analysis. But the, for example, when, when I became president of the union, or even before that, it was to raise the issue of solidarity with Julian Assange. Most journalists and um, the union I, I'm in represents most mainstream journalists in Australia, similar to the NUJ in Britain. Um, there was a lot of people who were saying, well, is he really a journalist? Should, should we really be bothering with him? 
And it was a particular uh, part of my presidency to make sure that the union was full square behind the campaign um, to release Assange, um, warts, warts and all, because it wasn't really about him. It was about the prosecution of uh, journalism and a free press, and that's what it, it represented. Um, who controls information? Um, do the do the whole Whitehall, the Pentagon, the White House have um, a, a monopoly on who controls information? And, and I suppose that pro that aspect of the program of WikiLeaks is one that we can share. That we are for transparency. We are for tearing up the secret pacts of the bourgeois states. So I think we do overlap um, in terms of the program, but we we are under no illusions that the, merely the the expression and release of that information will lead to a spontaneous uprising against imperialism. Um, but from those very small numbers, we did manage to transform uh, this into the beginnings of a mass movement in Australia in particular. We had uh, ended up with a cross-party um, parliamentary group, they include Conservatives, Greens, Labor Party members calling for his release. Um, the Conservatives involved uh, basically uh, it was it was driven by nationalism, which you would ex expect. You know, Assange may be a rat bag, uh, but he's our rat bag, and he shouldn't be in a U.S. jail. He should be in, in an Australian jail. Was almost some of the Conservative uh, uh, rhetoric. So this multi-pronged approach for release was both bottom-up, it was about building mass movement, the demonstrations uh, outside courts in London, the protests in the United States, um, people in the sun and the rain, you know, on the street campaigning. It never hit mass demonstration, but also the um, the there were... Uh, it, it did start to become a mass sentiment in Australia in particular that he should no longer be in jail. Uh, it was, it, and he was a symbol of journalism in jail for many. Um, there was a similar parallel to, there was an Australian called David Hicks who um, trained with the Taliban just before 9-11 and ended up in Guantanamo Bay. He'd never fired a shot. He was, you know, he became radicalised, went to Afghanistan to train with the Taliban got caught up in the post 9-11 um, uh, um, US police actions against anybody involved and was in Guantanamo. And he had to plead guilty to a, a minor terrorism charge and then was released. I'm not saying at all that Assange is a terrorist, but uh, if you listen to some of the rhetoric of the US, including people like Clinton, including people like Biden, they did call him a terrorist. And that was the attitude of the US intelligence community to him. So getting him out was no mean feat. And look, the interesting thing I want to say finally about the Assange case is now that he's out, many of the Assangistas are sour at the credit being given to the Australian Prime Minister, Anthony Albanese. Now, I'm uh, Anthony Albanese is getting a lot of credit for his release. Of course, he was dragged semi-unwillingly to the Assange case, uh, although he did he was one of the few people in the Labor Party leadership who was has been consistent for the last few years to, to have him freed. Many, many were very hostile. I know you have probably you have this culture in the Labor Party in Britain, but anyone to the left of you is just dismissed as a trot, and he's just seen as a trot, and that that's just a catch-all for anyone, and therefore I don't have to engage with you, I just condemn you. That's like a, a curse word here as it is in, in Britain. Um, but I would say that Assange would not have been freed in this way at this time if the ALP hadn't been in government. This isn't to say that the ALP has been squeaky clean on this, quite the contrary. But it shows an inadequacy in a lot of the anarchists and their understanding of power. They see all power as coming from the base up, which, of course, is hugely important as advocates of working class power. But also you need the salient of top-down power of, to, to get results. And I think uh, in, a, in, a, in a quite a tortured way, the, the fact that it required the ALP in government, it probably required Biden in government as well. And I don't know what Trump's attitude would have been. Um, but anyway, I just uh, wanted to make that final point on that. Um, 
that you need a strategy that involves bottom up and top down in in, in these um, power struggles. So second part, I'll be brief, uh, Tina. The who owns information? Um, I'm not sure the answer to this. I'll throw this. I'll make it'll be interesting to hear what comrades think. Obviously, you want to. Um, you can talk about knowledge capital, privacy, AI, and social media. We hear a lot about knowledge capital, but is that actually a form of capital in a Marxist sense? I'd like to know what you all think. Information and knowledge, of course, under capitalism um, are produced uh, by capitalist firms as commodities, petty producers, artists, musicians, freelance workers produce and sell information and knowledge. Um, if you look at the media, where, which is where I've worked for 25 years, previous model was that capital owned a chokehold on the production of knowledge in the form of news media and used that as production leverage to create an audience for advertisers. And that's how they made millions and millions of dollars. That all got smashed by the internet. And now social media, primarily Google and Facebook, have hoovered those dollars up now and you see mass sackings of journalists in in the uh, capitalist world as all that advertising money has shifted to the social media giants um I, i'll aim to finish at 5 30 or 5 30 in the morning here whatever 8 30 there tina um at the sydney morning Herald, where i used to work for a long time uh, we, we we used to have a five-story building that occupied we and media occupied legacy media mainstream media occupied all five floors. Google moved into the ground floor, then the first floor, and literally ate the building up from below. Um, and uh, fair, the City Morning Herald was bought by another media organization and Google took over the whole building. So the CPGB draft program, I had a look at it on this question, calls for the socialization of internet service providers public cloud infrastructure and other nat natural monopolies in communications and an end to the corruption and advertising funded media. I mean, I think this is a good start, but I think given the international character of Google and Facebook, I think we, we need to have a, a broader and deeper program uh, on this. Um, the capitalist state has had no real way to respond. There's a bit of a crisis in information and media. Facebook and Google are now mass, mass um, monopolies. Um, I wrote an article a few years ago on, on this when Facebook banned news media in Australia, and they've, they've done similar things in Canada. When the governments have tried to force uh, these Facebook and Google to pay some money back to legacy media companies for the stories that they carry to get their own audience. Um, and I thought of an analogy. In, in December 1883, um, a man called Gardner Green Hubbard was a, a businessman, lawyer, and founder of the journal Science and the National Geographic Society. He railed against a privately owned technology company upon which the great bulk of American business and political communication relied. Telegraph company Western Union had created the infrastructure and electrical public square of the Gilded Age of US capitalism. And with that came inordinate power. He wrote at the time, the importance of this business transcends its magnitude for every political, general or local item of interest is sent by telegraph. And upon this news, every daily paper depends for existence, every important business transaction between parties at a distance and the most important and vital commun social communications are carried on by telegraph. He was deeply concerned that with this power, Western Union was a threat to American democracy given its control over the flow of information. This sounds pretty familiar. Today, Facebook and Google exercise a similar monopolistic control over the huge volumes of electronic communication, information, and related advertising that are the lifeblood of the modern age. And as with the case of Western Union, their power is largely unregulated. In the US between 1866 and 1900, Every elected Congress, save for one, considered legislation to tame Western Union's power. There were no less than 96 bills and resolutions brought before Congress that addressed the problem of Western Union. And during this period, Congress published 48 reports into the monopoly power of the telegraph company. That's more than one report a year, rivaling even the number of reports the Australian Parliament has put out into publishing diversity, digital platform and media ownership. 
So they called for Western Union's, Hubbard called for Western Union's business to be handed over to the post office to, to be nationalised effectively. All attempts to regulate the company failed. Uh, it wasn't until uh, Hubbard's own company, Bell Telephone, uh, uh, eventually swept aside Western Union's dominance of communication. The last Western Union telegram was sent on the 27th of January, 2006. So I, I use that as an analogy because capitalism has no way to regulate Facebook and Google. And we can't nationalise them. I mean, I've, I've heard Galloway and I've heard other sort of nationalist left politicians call for the nationalisation. Some have advocated for, a Brit, I think, a British search engine or an Australian search. I mean, it's just crazy autarkic nonsense. So uh, the, the only um, path forward we have is internationalising these um, um, controllers, not nationalising them. And the, the only analogy that exists, I think, in the modern world um, is the way the internet has emerged. And if you look at the World Wide Web, and um, uh, so the back end of the web, the World Wide Web Consortium, W3C, is run by Tim Berners-Lee. Um, it's a global not-for-profit body that manages the structure and language of the, the, the web. Uh, so it ensures that a computer in Sao Paulo is able to communicate smoothly with a mobile device in Cairo. I think a similar model could work to manage global search functions, maps, information libraries, and other search engines. Wikipedia is also a successful non-commercial model. Such consortia could act as a model for a network of social platforms that democratically engage communities rather than treat them as a host from which to extract data to commercialize. And this also raises the question of privacy, which isn't um, in the CPGB program. Obviously, these massive institutions uh, uh, have access to a lot of our information. Um, Facebook and Google can predict what we want for our birthday better than our partners probably can. And um, a lot of them will know our, our private peccadilloes from our search engine history more than anybody else. This is massively... Uh, um, uh, this is, uh, you know, there's a lot of concern about privacy. This will exist also, I'd say, under socialism. In the EU, you've got the right to be forgotten law. And I think that's something worth examining and extending in, in some way, because under socialist society, we'll still want privacy. My final point is on, and I'm, I know I'm trying to pack in a lot here, uh, artificial intelligence, which is also a dominant force now in these these. Um, online search engines uh, and online communities. We hear a lot of doom and gloom about human versus machine, that under AI, the humans, you know, we get Arnold Schwarzenegger and Terminator and Skynet and all those memes. Of course, AI is just another form of capital. Um, like previous capitals designed to suck labour power from workers for private interests. This has taken a new technological form um, but the fear that AI, uh, the machines will control humanity is just part of the ongoing horror story uh, of capitalism. Marx said, capital is dead labor, that vampire-like only lives by sucking living labor and lives the more, the more labor it sucks. So AI at the moment is sucking the intellectual property of authors, artists, musicians, and presenting it back to us as the original work of the machine. I know uh, my union and the International Federation of Journalists and a lot of um, actors' unions, there was the big actors' strike recently around this issue. Uh, under capitalism, AI will continue to rob us of our information and our, and our create creativity. And I would say it's only in a socialist and, uh, you know, Steve Freeman, yes, this is propaganda for communism. Only in a communist society under a global commune that machines can be used as tools to liberate us from drudgery. At the moment, lots of memes around saying, I want AI to do my dishes and laundry so I can focus on art, writing and music rather than AI producing all the art, writing and music. While on some levels that's inane, there is a profound truth here about information, capital, labour and freedom. And I will leave it there. Thank you, comrade. We're actually going to have a session on AI in September um, where we look into some of those issues in a bit more detail. That was a really 
fascinating look at some of the aspects that we don't usually talk about when we when we talk about um, Julian Assange. Um, comrades, do you have any questions or contributions? Short ones, because uh, Marcus actually has to go to work now. <laughs> Soon, uh, we're gonna uh, try to bring them in. I've got a I've got a couple of uh, questions to get the ball rolling. Um, you did you did touch on that, of course. Why is it being released now? And there was a bit of there was there was some chatter um, a few weeks lo leading up to it. You seem to locate it mainly uh, in pressure from the or the campaign from the Australian government rather than when you're looking at the reports here, it tends to be uh, the thought was that the US elections are playing quite a big role, that Biden tried to take that bit off his plate and perhaps get the youth vote uh, on board. How do you think in, in a you know priority of, 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 of force? Yeah, where... I think they definitely had, I think Biden, the Biden camp, because um, I'm not sure how much Biden is aware of these things, but anyway, I'm sure the Biden camp did not... Um, want to have a court case um, of, of a freedom warrior during an election that Trump could then use against Biden. Um, I think that definitely play, played a part. Um, the Yeah, so the other... Um, uh, yeah, the other the other uh, aspect of the timing, of course, was that there was a really interesting article in the Washington Post soon after his release the legal advice to the US government was that they would lose in the British courts eventually. Now, uh, this was also the, the 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 thought of the Assange camp, that eventually they could win legally, but that might be in two years or three years. And they didn't want Julian. Julian was very unwell in jail and they were worried about his, his health and his life. I mean, that he was... Um, in court reports uh, reported as suicidal at times, which is not surprising given the amount of time he'd been in jail um, and the deprivation he'd, he'd faced. So I think those played into the timing as well. Mm. Thank you. Um, another interesting issue was at the beginning, you know, the, the this question about um, truth and peace and war and lies, et cetera. I mean, you, you did touch on, you know, that's a very simplistic way to look at wars, what wars are being fought over and, and how they're being fought over. And, and also, I mean, you know, how many people will have actually read the WikiLeaks? You know, I, I think it's this is a this is not something that millions of people will read. How do you how do you see the role of say communists like like us interpreting the truth? You know, how important is it not just to have it out there, but actually make sense of it and you know that relates to the issue about media um whereas it's really important that we fight for the democratization of course of existing um companies like google and facebook etc clearly we also have to build our own um our own media and our own servers and our own um, uh, channels etc how, how do you see that role of the the mediation uh, between you know truth and masses of people yeah so so yes most people have not looked at i'd say most people even in this discussion haven't trawled through wikileaks information but most people have seen the um collateral damage not most a, a huge chunk of the human population would have seen the um collateral uh murder video of the apache helicopter shooting up uh, Iraqi civilians and journalists. Um, that that will be why that is a an image that's as seared on uh, human consciousness really as the napalm children from the Vietnam War. I would say it's a, it's a very striking. So yes, but the the role of Marxists is to take information, interpret it, and and um, and take it uh, through media and organisation. Ultimately, organisation is is what counts and unity around a democratic program for social change. And information can feed into that, uh, but it's a, it's about having a democratic program for, for social change that is essential. But change will not come spontaneously. Um, and I think that is the big difference between the program of... of enlightened anarchism um i'm quite sympathetic to anarchists um it's not meant pejoratively but um uh i think that's the difference between to, between marxists understanding history as social forces 
uh, and the need for unity of the working class to achieve lasting democratic and radical change. Mm. So it's interesting, the, the question of conspiracy theories, etc. And that is, it is a tricky one here in the Labour Party, for example, there were con does what there was a conspiracy against Corbyn. Clearly, there were people working together to get rid of him and to do the left in, etc. But of course, that's sort of without the organized left taking a lead on these issues and explaining it properly and fighting a proper fight. It's it's now common knowledge that, you know, Israel is pulling the strength of the Labour Party, uh, etc. Rubbish, rubbish conspiracy theories trying to explain a complex, you know, situation. Again, how do you how do you see in, in terms of the, the role of Marxist communists to to tackle easy answers to why, you know, why is the US supporting Israel, for example? So I think the, the fact that a lot of this information, um, such as US war crimes, British war crimes, everyone knows Blair lied, 45 minutes, everyone knows Blair lied. Um, it, it produces a deep cynicism in people, mm -hmm. I think. that uh, So for people who aren't particularly engaged in politics, they just say, oh, well, Blair lies. Uh, they all lie. Corbyn lies. They all they all must lie. Trump lies. Biden lies. You all lies. I'm just going to go to Tesco. You know, people just disengage, mm. uh, and it produces a deep cynicism in the working class. And I think that's, I mean, without being a conspiracist myself, I think that is part of part of the aim is to create deep cynicism so to 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 stop effective social change. And I think this does take root in um, people who want. Uh, social change that they see everything as a conspiracy um that covid was a conspiracy that china must have released a virus um etc it's every everything becomes a conspiracy it's like the flip side of of apolitical cynicism is this deeply paranoid uh, conspiracy theory where uh, and some of it does veer into um anti-semitism on the left and the right uh, in terms of um, uh, um, uh, in terms of some of these conspiracies, but not exclusively. I mean, and I think Trump um, cynically uses this cynicism uh, and, and demagogues on the right cynically use that cynicism for their own purposes like Farage, Brexit, and so on. I think you see that widespread. Absolutely. Um, Mark, please. Uh, yeah, firstly, it's absolutely great uh, that he got out. Uh, delighted myself and lots of friends of mine who are not massively political, to be fair, but everybody, lots of people felt it was an injustice what happened to him. Um, a, a few things. Uh, I've been writing, obviously, for about 20-odd years and getting paid for it, uh, sometimes, well, mostly fairly poorly, to be fair. But even from the beginning, it was very, very difficult to get anything about the excesses of the military into the major. Uh, in 2002, 2003, uh, I wrote an article for the journal newspaper, which is about the heroism of British soldiers going back to uh, secure the bodies of their dead comrades in the crater in Aden. And that got printed on the basis that the John would then follow it up with three further articles about the excesses which uh, they then engaged in is retribution for the their comrades having been killed. And all of those articles were pulled. Uh, the deputy uh, in charge of the journal newspaper uh, quit on the spot and the story has never, ever resurfaced in the last 20, 21, 21 years. Uh, it's slightly ironic, that's just as an aside, there's plenty of other stories I could uh, go on and talk about in terms of the military, uh, particularly some of the things that, of course, are then done to them. Uh, the Gulf War syndrome, of course, was when people were actually poisoned as a result of organophosphates. It had nothing to do with military conflict. And most of the lads who had Gulf War syndrome that I worked with on that issue back in the early part of this century, they're long since gone, they're dead even in their 40s and 50s, fairly fit blokes, to be fair. 
The irony about Wikipedia is itself its own restrictions on putting information was pretty prevalent. Uh, the reasons why I particularly faced this is that many of the stories which I tried to put on Wikipedia were stories that had actually broken. Some of them were political stories and some of them were football stories. But they have to be run through a uh, somebody who vets those stories. And if they didn't think it went with the norm that was on there, they basically just said, well, you're promoting your own work. And obviously my response to that was, well, it was my work that's proved these stories to be accurate and true, but nevertheless, they would they were just simply, simply knock knock back. Um, yeah, there's plenty of other stuff which I'd done in the big issue in the North magazine, which I tried to get onto Wikipedia, stuff which had even been as you couldn't call it a bourgeois newspaper, but a, a newspaper of sorts. But sometimes you just couldn't get past past the censors. But that aside, you know, I'm full of praise for Wikipedia, and when the opportunity came up to put bits of money into it, uh, I certainly did do so. Thanks. Thanks, Mark. Um, quickly, Steve Freeman, and then we're going to go back to Marcus, who has to go to work now. Um, Steve. Hi, Marcus. Yeah, um, very, very good, good, interesting talk. And giving us an Australian side to it, which is a missing thing for us over here. There's also a kind of British side to it as well, in terms of campaigning that went on here, and what we can learn about the way in which politics works in this country which is really important. And we we in we did election leaflet. And I'm proud to say that we it concentrated on Palestine and democracy, but we included free Julian Assange. We did no idea at that point, that in fact, during the course of the election campaign, because of our intervention, obviously, he, he was let out. So I didn't I don't think you've counted that in your analysis, Marcus. But our, our election leaflet, I think, possibly was a tipping point, you know. But anyway, a couple of other points really. There was a big argument here, and, and you and you covered that as well, because Julian Assange lost a lot of support because some people looked at it about to be dealing with him as a person. Did this man do these things in Sweden or not? Was it a smear? Everybody went down that plug hole. It's not about a person. It's about the issues. That's the really important thing. And you could say, well, whether Julian Assange did or didn't do these things, it doesn't matter. He's been hammered because he is a journalist and he is exposing truth to us and I think that's the important thing and don't knock and I don't think he did do that but in a way truth is revolutionary so I think anything that uh, exposes the truth raises consciousness you know as in as in Pravda truth and justice of course a famous name for baby but but as you say quite rightly just because you're exposing truth you can combine that with anarchist politics. You can combine that with Stalinist politics. It doesn't necessarily have a progressive thing, just merely in and of itself, truth and justice. But I think it's it, that is a you know exposing the truth does raise people's consciousness about what the true state of thing is. Science, really, isn't it? You know, it's a scientific approach to the world. And now my last point will just be this, Marcus. You're absolutely right. Certain problems, certain issues, cannot be solved on a national basis. Capitalism is a global system, and many problems are part of a global system of power and can't be solved in any one country. I think that's it. And when, you, when you're talking about AI and things like this, then we're getting into that whole area that only global solutions can deal with those, and national ones can't. But the but is, that doesn't mean, therefore, that all we can do is sit in one country making propaganda for a world solution. But you can do that. But you have to have a strategy for how to deal with the question of democracy in whatever country you happen to be in, whether that's Australia or whether it's here in the UK. And I think that most of the left don't do that, either pose the global thing or indeed pro pose the importance of, of democracy has got to be fundamental. And you said that, Marcus, I'm not, it's not a disagreement with you uh, at all. All right, thank you. And uh, nice to see you again, by the way. Looking well, talking sense. Looking well and talking sense, great. Doesn't get much better than that. <laughs> okay, um, we're going to have to, um, can't bring any more contributions in now. So, Marcus, would you like to reply to a few comments there? Um, yeah, well, thank you. And uh, if you're at Communist University this year, you'll get to see a bit more of me in person. I'll be, I'll be, I'll be coming. Um, I think I, I'm, uh, I'm not listed as a speaker yet, but um, I think I am giving a talk on philosophy and physics. Um, and does 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 matter exist? Um, so 
can have a think about uh, that. Of course it does. Yeah, well, some quantum physicists don't think it does. But anyway, uh, I, in my day job is working with a lot of quantum physicists and they've got some very interesting ideas, some of them. Um, so, yeah, I think I'll just pick up with, with, from, from Steve on, on consciousness raising. I mean, consciousness raising is um, an organising tool as well. I mean, if you look back at the civil rights movement in the US, the anti-racist movement, um, overcoming internalised racism, uh, uh, um, comrades in, in, in the um, black liberation movement, it was all about consciousness raising. What is the source of our poverty? What is the source of our lack of power of our home, you know, our shit homes, you know, our bad jobs. I mean, so consciousness raising is hugely important, but it, it, it but it needs to be an organizing tool. You need to combine, if you don't combine information and consciousness raising with organization, I think you can, you, you breed cynicism and you breed hopelessness and individualism and isolationism. If, if all you know is that the world is shit, why bother doing anything? Um, if there's no hope, if there's no uh, collective uh, organization, if there's no like-minded people to uh, feel the glimmers of freedom with, I mean, that is what we also do as Marxists. We're not just doomsayers at all. I mean, we, we're the ultimate in, in hope givers, aren't we? Um, we we're, we're, we're saying that only our program is the one that can lead us out of this shit. Um, uh, and I, I think that um, that is an important... It's very difficult to remain positive, but I think a democratic program for radical social change at the national level and international are hugely important. On this question of national versus international, I think any successful radical national movement where people with politics like ours came to power at the national level, you can imagine the opprobrium from the world's bourgeoisie. They would cut you off the internet if they could. They would. There would be massive retaliation at an international level. So if you're democratic, I, I think that's even more the case now than in 1917 and, and the failed Russian Revolution, um, that if your program is not immediately international in some form, you will get crushed. And I think um, we have to be very cognizant of, of, of that and we have to organise internationally um, uh, uh, because the, the the speed of information is much greater. Um, if if um, if a lie is halfway around the world before truth gets its boots on, as as they say, that that process is massively accelerated in today's information age, and we see that, and it's cynically used. Um, uh, and I think one of the positive things about WikiLeaks and why I think Julian Assange is a hero despite, I mean, I don't know what his politics are like now after 14 years in jail. Um, I think the, the guy just needs some time in the Australian bush looking at the horizon. I heard that when he was flying, he hadn't seen a horizon for 12 years. And um, he, his lawyer, um, Jennifer Robinson, who I know, said that um, he spent the whole time looking at the plane at the horizon because he hadn't seen one. I mean, and, and that level of personal deprivation is inconceivable. And that's why I called him the, the, a man in the iron mask. But I, so I don't know where his personal politics are now. But one of the, the I think the positive things of, of WikiLeaks is that it's a challenge to us Luddites in the Marxist movement. I mean, do, do you know of any Marxist organizations with a really professional online presence? with a really, really good understanding of online security, of being able to project well uh, using modern information technology. I don't. I, 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 we're, we're really, really bad at it. And I think unless we get good at it, we're going to be um, stuck in online chat rooms of 42 people for a long time. <laughs> and um, I think we need to be much more ambitious. And I think WikiLeaks challenges us to be ambitious. I mean, WikiLeaks 
hit billions of people. Billions of people began to have some consciousness raising uh, because of the work of WikiLeaks. And it's that kind of elan and audacity uh, of WikiLeaks that I think we should be inspired by um, and challenge ourselves um, uh, to to raise ourselves uh, uh, to that to that level of social engagement. I'll leave it there. Very good last words, absolutely. And even just on a, on the level of um, you know the, the internet uh, and revolution. They have, we've seen that they they don't just switch off the the ruling class can switch off not just websites it can switch off the whole bloody internet if there's a revolution happening so unless we actually get our act together and and form our own technical solutions as well as political solutions and professionalize our output etc I mean this is really good but you know it could it could be better just a touch so but you know we we have to we have to take that seriously. Thank you very much, Mark. It's a really interesting uh, view at some aspects of the Assange case that most people hadn't hadn't looked at, uh, and from your perspective, so that was that was great. Please come rest, join us next week. We're going to be joined by John Dunn um, from the All Grief Truth uh, Truth and Justice campaign to review the film Strike and Uncivil War. If you get a chance to watch it somewhere, please do. It is brilliant it is really really good um it's an it's an excellent look at particularly the all grief um uh, picket that was crushed by the police but puts it in a really Im in important political context we're also going to be looking at the book citizen marks by the author bruno leibold who'll be jo joining us to to discuss this in a bit more detail so lots to look forward to and um, you know if you're staying up tonight enjoy or not as as it may go the not the andromar show is on from i think a quarter to 10 to um uh, have a live live discussion on on all the various issues so thanks very much marcus um have a good day and the others have a good evening bye bye comrades